welcome everyone to this workshop. Um, where should I start developing your career at UC Berkeley? My name is Chris McLean, and I manage career programs for campus staff that are housed in the Tang Center, uh, University Health Services. And I'm joined by two colleagues who provide many of the services in the career development area for campus staff, and I'll have them introduce themselves. Hi, good morning. My name is Terry Moore. I'm a career counselor at the Tang Center. Uh, and I have the privilege to work with UC Berkeley staff members. Thanks for the chance to be here today. Hi, my name is Paula Jung. I'm the Career Counseling Library Manager over at the Tang Center, and I work with both students and staff on campus, and um, I offer individual consultations inside the library as well as help staff with uh, career exploration, resources, and occupational information that I can provide. Great. Um, so, um, Objectives for the workshop today are several, including um, it really provides us an opportunity to share a career development model that we really think will help encourage uh, motivation and achievement of career development goals. We will have you do a self-assessment exercise to kind of understand where you might need a little bit more support in the career planning process. You'll learn about some key uh, career development resources and also review some keys to moving forward. Clarity, confidence, and communication, which is part of our uh, career management component of our career development model. And then we'll finish today by setting a career uh, planning action goal. Um, in the packet of information that you have for the workshop today, we don't have slides of our PowerPoint or our Prezi presentation, but you have an outline um, where you can follow along if you'd like to take some notes. Um, there's some space for you to do that. So the context of career development at Berkeley is where we want to start. Um, and I'd like a, a show of hands. How many of you here have been working on campus less than two years? Can I have? Wow. OK. So a lot of new folks. <laughs> Great. Um, how about two to five years? Five to 10? More than 10. OK, great. So this is actually um, a pretty representative of the folks that we see in our career development services, uh, maybe oriented a little bit more than typical to newer staff on campus. Um, as we review the different content for this workshop, uh, we really want you to listen to what's most relevant to you. Um, you're going to hear a lot about different resources, and we really want you to be active listeners, to think about what is your particular situation, your hopes and challenges in career development, and what resources specifically will be helpful to you in taking a next step in your career planning. When we started providing these services uh, to campus staff, it was about seven and a half years ago. At that time, those of you who have been on campus more than five years um, uh, will probably be familiar with the Career Compass initiative. Um, so Career Compass was a very um, ambitious undertaking by the campus to redefine all the job titles on campus, to make it really clear what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary necessary for each position on campus. There wasn't a budget crisis at that time. The economy was pretty good. Um, and this was an effort, the career development services, where we got funding from what is now learning and organizational development, was to help um, staff in clarifying what is their direction on campus. Um, who are they in terms of like, what are your interests, skills, abilities? How do you do career pathing at UC Berkeley? Soon after that Career Compass initiative was undertaken, we went into a national um, economic recession um, that had really some very significant consequences for the state of California, and UC Berkeley was really heavily impacted. In my time here, I've been here now 20 years on campus. Um, it was a period of, of pretty considerable layoffs, um, and that led to operational excellence, which was initiated in 2009, um, of, and to look at 
How can the university provide services, do its work to be a first-rate academic institution in an efficient way, in the best way um, to um, serve the, the goals of the university? And so with operational excellence, there's been tremendous amount of change on campus. And when there's change, I think it really affects people in different ways. I think there are some opportunity, but for a lot of people, you were thinking that my job is going to change? What is that going to be like? Will I have a job? Um, there have also been some new opportunities. And so I give this as background um, as a way of um, saying to you all that never has career development been more important to campus staff uh, on the, here at UC Berkeley. And our services for you individually and through various workshops um, and other resources are free of charge to you um, in, and are confidential. And we really are inspired to provide services that help you feel like you're making um, movement in your career development. So the career development model that we use is one where um, over the course of the day, we're gonna identify some competencies and some skills related to each of these different components of the model. The first component, um, so here's the model, is self-assessment. Self-assessment includes looking at what is the relationship between qualities that are important to you and career opportunities. We really like to promote this sense that you have an identity in the career area um, and to understand what are interests, values, personality type or work style preferences, skills and competencies, work-life balance for you. These are all components of this career self-assessment. And it's gonna be different for everyone in this room. And to think about how do you clarify yourself in each of these areas of, uh, with regard to your career. Career awareness has to do with learning about careers trends, work culture, and jobs within the UC system. One of the reasons why I'm very passionate about career development as a psychologist is that I think career development gets short shrift. Um, when we work with students, they're coming on campus, they're 18, 19 years old, they feel like they have to have their future all figured out. If, if not, there's something wrong with them. And so really it's developmentally appropriate, really at all stages at your career, but particularly at that stage to explore, to know yourself, what's important to you, but also to learn about the world of work. How do you get good information uh, about what's out there? Skills that are needed for jobs, um, what people do in different positions. And so this is all part of the career awareness piece. Goal setting. Goal setting is really integrating information about yourself, kind of that career identity piece, what's important to you in work, with a career development plan. And so it entails you know, setting short-term, long-term goals. Skill development is really knowing and then developing skills needed for career advancement or enrichment. Um, so if it's not advancement, it might be positioning yourself for a more rewarding um, position that might be more aligned with your interests and values. And then finally, career management. When you look at the model, um, this is subsumed within the other four um, components of the model, and this is really you in the middle. And career management includes those three C's of career management, Clarity, knowing yourself and the world of work. So that's the self-assessment and then the career awareness piece. Confidence. As Linda mentioned, with all this change, you know, it's so, it, 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 it evokes a lot of uncertainty and doubt. Um, and it's often easy to not take advantage of opportunities. Oh, it won't work out. Um, but to really pay attention to how do you feel confident in yourself? We'll get into that more later. And then communication is really knowing your strengths and being able to effectively communicate those strengths. 
So that's our model, um, and we'll soon be moving into, as in right now, um, the career model, development model assessment. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, I, I noticed there's a, a lot of jotting down notes. Just want a reminder, um, in addition to the handouts, um, we'll be publishing um, a list of the, a copy of these slides up on the web at some point, so you don't have to worry about jotting everything that's down right now. Um, so after, since we've kind of briefly gone through the model, um, you probably all noticed that you're all in different places, whether it's a result of planned or unplanned changes and challenges. So we're gonna take a step back and give you a moment at this, a few moment, minutes to um, actually go through um, a self-assessment and really um, give you a chance to identify priorities for you as far as your career, career development. So if you look in your handout on page four, on page five, you'll find um, the career development competencies assessment. So does everybody have a packet? If not, there's a few extras um, around some tables of, oh, pens. Do we have extra pens in the room? I have, I have an extra pen. Didn't everyone raise their hand if they need a pen? I have a couple here. I have a couple in my hand, perfect. Did everybody have a handout, find a handout? Okay, perfect. Um, so I wanna take, take a moment, just read through each of the statements on this list and then score them. Score each competency area and then at that point, you're gonna total each area by subtotal. And then when you're done, you have, there's a space on that second page of the assessment to transfer the total scores. And I'll give you a few minutes to go and begin that process. As far as scoring, so really take note um, of the five areas of the model, according to that assessment, which areas did you score the highest and which ones did you score the lowest? And if you could, actually, if you have an evaluation form, it'd be great to note um, for us for data collection purposes, if you can note the areas that you scored the highest, as well as the lowest. So now I'm gonna give you a moment to uh, get to know your neighbor. Um, in the area you scored the highest, what do you do to contribute to the strength? And share an example with that person. So I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and do that. So during your partner exercise, um, were there any surprises, um, any similarities, any differences, anything that really struck you? Any volunteers who like to share either their partner's experience or their own personal experience? Yes. I think um, we had very different experiences. She's quite new to campus and I've been here a long time. We have different types of jobs and everything, but we had actually the very same highest and lowest ratings of our self-assessment. Okay. And I think we kind of figured out that the, that the, um, the, uh, skill, de the skill development is the fun thing <laughs> because you go to classes you go to workshops you go to conferences you you learn new stuff you take classes online you know that's that's cool that's mm -hmm. fun learning new stuff is is great mm -hmm. um it's the goal setting and the management of your career huh. that's not as fun huh. <laughs> I mean, that's a great comment. I think often what, what you, when you think of learning opportunities, it seems more active, more, more engaging, right? So how do we get those other two areas to be more active and engaging as well? Um, another comment, thank you for sharing that. 
Yeah, hi, my partner and I um, were in different stages of our careers, but we identified a, a big and common question, which is um, if you do develop skills and you're in, say, an assistant position and you manage to acquire and get a job where you can do the use your preferred skills, then how do you convince them to reclass you and start mm. advancing your career? Mm. Great question. <laughs> and I hope that um, we'll be touching on that a little bit as far as um, class, job classifications um, and how to really gather the information that you need to have that conversation, um, maybe with your supervisor or colleagues, um, just to get some um, advice on how they perhaps had that conversation at some point. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through that in a bit during um, our workshop here. But um, I think a lot of it is gathering that knowledge for yourself, walking into that conversation with that, um, being able to have some evidence, right, of what you've done. And just one, just one more. Thanks. Well, this is uh, a little bit related to that. So my partner and I know each other, but she's new to campus, and I've been here 15 years. Uh -huh. um, and she's so she's like way ahead of the game from where I've where I've been. And one of the things I've noticed is that that culture on campus seems to have shifted significantly in the 15 mm -hmm. years I've been here mm -hmm. from one in which, at least in a number of places, managers were looking for people. I describe it as you have basic reading skills, basic, ma basic math skills, you smile, you show up on time, and you work hard. Mm -hmm. And if you do those things, then 80% of the jobs on campus are trainable within 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and once you hire someone, you know if they show up on time and they work hard and they smile, and so you let them move around in mm -hmm. your purview mm -hmm. because you don't want to risk having someone who doesn't smile or show up on time except for their interview. Yeah. Um, and that that has shifted significantly to more managers who are looking for qualifications on paper regardless of, of experience and relationships in a particular campus or department. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it's great that newer people are here because I feel like um, loyalty to particular departments is less valued and reciprocated than it used to be. And I don't think that's a mean-spirited thing, but I think it's a, a change in sort of the environment we work in. And so folks who are here new, be nice to everybody you're working with still, but um, I, I, I think it's less true that, that folks have your back in the way that I felt it was true mm -hmm. when I started here. Mm -hmm. And Chris or Terry, do you have anything to add to that comment? Because I thought that was really insightful. You know, one of the things that I thought John Wilton did a really nice job of this morning was to indicate that, um, in a way, and Chris often uses this expression, that Berkeley is not immune to some of the forces that are out there in the larger environment. Um, and so, uh, you know, having uh, been through a downturn and so on, I think there is a need, you know, as Chris said, to make career development really an important aspect of how you focus your energies. Um, because there is more onus on the individual. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to add to that, I, but I think there is a reality that the workforce on campus is different. Um, like, I think there's a higher proportion of staff who are on kind of contract or temporary funding um, than before. Um, in my experience, when we first started doing this seven years ago, it was much more like you're in a career status position. And so that might have something to do with it. Um, I, I, I think where research on career development is pretty consistent um, is still around the importance of um, those interpersonal skills, what it means to be a team player, um, collaborating um, either with others in your department or other departments, where I do feel like that's part of the operating principles and a value on campus. So, um, so I think that part is still important, but I do think there's, there's, there is a real change to the work um, culture. Um, and so all of the organizational you know, upheaval and, and change. Um, you know, we're still kind of in the early stages of getting used to that. Again, thank you for sharing that. So before I turn it over to Chris, just you know, a reminder, after doing this assessment and going through this exercise and really reflecting on what um, you've done so far on this campus and at Berkeley, um, it's also, in, in addition to noting um, you know, what you haven't done, it's also important to note that what you have done, actively have done to um, move your career forward here at Berkeley. So noticing areas of where you scored low as well as areas you scored high. So noting areas that you might want to use to explore a little bit. Use this opportunity to explore those areas. 
Okay, so I'm going to turn it to Chris, and he's going to talk about the um, our career action plan a little bit. So um, in your packet, you've got a lot of information in the career planning action guide that has information about resources that are available to you in each of the components of the career development model that we've developed here on campus. And we're going to start by just um, going through each of those components and maybe doing a little show and tell, um, showcasing a, a, a particular resource or some thoughts related to each of the components that um, can be useful in your career planning. Um, starting first with So one, so a tip for you would be to look at maybe prioritizing the areas where you are lower in the career development model self-assessment as a point of, of emphasis in, in going through the action guide. And now we'll go through each of the components. And so starting with self-assessment, we have a, a lot of resources for folks um, to address self-assessment. So we have workshops um, on interests, on the Myers-Briggs type indicator to look at personal style preferences and implication for workplace fit, um, for communication on the job and so forth. We have values um, assessment workshop and skills. Each of those components, like I mentioned earlier, is gonna be weighted differently for each of you. And so we have some tools to help you clarify how important each of those dimensions are to you. One specific uh, highlight I wanna want to uh, give note to is on the interest side of things. Um, how many of you have taken the strong interest inventory? So it looks like you know maybe a third of folks have taken this in inventory. So I just want to highlight a few things about the strong interest inventory. And again, this is available as a workshop in one of our se workshop series. We have one in the summer. We will also have two strong workshops in the, in the fall semester. What the strong interest inventory does, it assesses your interest in six different uh, thematic areas. Artistic, social, enterprising, investigating, which has to do with math and science, um, realistic, um, and conventional. And so you get a general reading, uh, reading of where are you high and low without regard to work. And then it looks at how do your responses compare to men and women in 130 different occupations who are satisfied and experienced in their work. So by my way of thinking, this is the best constructed inventory to look at how interests map out onto the world of work. And so you get a general rating of your interests, and then you see how your responses compared to the unique likes and dislikes of men and women in 130 occupations. And it's not meant to be a directive tool to find the one career for you, it's really meant to explore and, ex and expand the range of options. And often you'll find some important themes that could be um, critical to your satisfaction in your career. So it's really meant to kind of highlight those themes related to career satisfaction. Uh, and again, you know, you hear a lot of different things about interests and work, like you got to follow your heart, you got to follow your passion. But others view it very differently and say, no, you know, it's like there are other values that are more important to me. It's nice if I can, you know, be aligned with my interests and in work. Um, but I, I like to think of, of uh, career in the sense of career and life planning. We want you to think of and try to make opportunities for you to align your interests with work as much as you can. But sometimes if important interests are not being satisfied in work, to encourage you to think about how do you nourish and give expression to that interest outside of work if it's not currently in your, in your position. So, that's um, a little heads up of one inventory that we have uh, available through workshops and also in individual career counseling. And we'll shift to career awareness and start with how this, these are the six interest themes, but also some resources Paul will tell you related to the strong interest inventory and career exploration. So again, career awareness is really about connecting what's um, important to you. So whether that's through a self-assessment, whether that's through conversations with your colleagues or your supervisors, um, or whether it's through um, exp 
personal and professional experiences, and really connecting that to what's out there, occupational information. And I'm gonna talk about these um, ONET um, as a resource later, but um, ONET and Eureka are just a couple resources that um, I could go through with you um, if you stop by the library at some point. I'm always in there and um, certainly welcome any questions that you have about any of the resources that we talk about today. And also as a reminder, as I'm going through some of these uh, resources um, on the action guide, which is your page six of your handout, that's where the career awareness portion is. And um, there's a lot more detail about some of the resources that I will be, um, I might be flying through some of them today, um, but wanted to make sure that you knew um, the location, the links and things like that when, when you, after leaving this uh, workshop. So career awareness, what does that mean again? So that means, um, how do you find information? Um, being aware of career options. So someone mentioned um, career tracks, um, career families. How do I even go about finding out um, how to advance myself to the next, um, the next thing, right? So this includes knowing your job function, the industry, um, which will not only help you to communicate your own goals, but I think this will really help drum up support um, around your own initiatives. And um, for example, so the Career Expo that's going on today for all of you, I think this is a great way to increase your career awareness, gathering information about upcom upcoming opportunities at campus. So I think this is a great opportunity. Um, this is something that they're bringing to you. So what else can you do um, when you, after you walk away from the NOW conference that you can do actively on your own, right? So. Um, sorry, before I move on. So these are just some of the things. Again, job families, job opportunities, job openings, um, operating principles and core competencies that sort of covering um, campus values and campus culture. And then you have divisions and departmental goals. So how do you go about aligning your own go goals with your own department, your own unit, your own division? And um, can't say this enough that networking is key. Um, whether that's through friends, family, joining a staff organization, former colleagues or supervisors. Um, where do most people find career information? I mean, I, often it's people say, hey, I just Google it now, right? Just put in a word and Google it. Um, but I think it's really important, uh, especially now, um, to re make that connection with somebody. Um, not only will you be able to collect different perspectives, different experiences, um, and really keep up to date about you know, current trends on campus, um, I think it's also a way to share your own perspectives. Um, Linda mentioned a lot that you have a lot of strengths that you can share, and it's all about building a community and helping um, each of us um, grow stronger and become more confident about making our own decisions, right? So I think um, creating that community of sharing and sharing of career awareness and um, information is also important. Um, so networking. Um, I think she mentioned what I don't, um, focusing on what often you don't know versus what you do know. So where do you go about finding that information? So I want to make sure I share some of those resources for you, with you today and uh, helping you expand um, that vision. So the first thing, operating principles. Is every, has everyone heard about the oper operating principles here at Cal? Pretty much. Okay, so um, toward a more together, innovative, simplified, accountable, and service-oriented workplace. So we include and excel together, we imagine and innovate, we simplify, we're accountable to each other, and we focus on service. So these are all things um, that describe um, shared values at Berkeley, the culture at Berkeley. So what can, you, what can you do with these operating principles? I think this is a great way to build it into your team communication, your team goals, your team meetings. And it's a really uh, great way um, for performance evaluations, um, trying to get that recognition that you feel like you've, you've, you deserve because you've added so much value. So this is a great way to voice it, right? So these are some of the, the values that the campus shares. This is how I've gone about to align my goals with these values. And then you also am thinking um, as far as campus interviews, they're really gonna embed a lot of these operating principles in those interview questions. So thinking about um, maybe a challenge situation where you had to come up with an innovating um, solution to something. That's just an example that where you can start preparing yourself um, on how to about going communicating your strengths and your values that you bring to the campus. Then you have um, along the, the same lines, core competencies. So these are 10 areas that the university has identified as being um, very critical values that they wanna see in their employees and their leaders. 
And um, these are a set of skills, set of knowledge, sets of uh, abilities um, that Berkeley staff and Berkeley faculty should be um, really focusing on. Um, did anyone go to State Day by any chance? State Day? Great, so a few of you. Um, so it was really interesting. I sat on a session at State Day and um, there's a unit on campus um, who um, was in charge of the Cal Student Central. And um, so I sat in on that, and that was a really fascinating dialogue because um, what they talked about was um, aligning um, their project with the core competencies at Cal. And it was just so interesting because by using this as a framework, um, it really guided them through all their challenges and difficulties that they faced um, with this project. And it really identified um, the areas that they needed to develop within their unit and just to make them more efficient. Um, and it, they really thought this, is, this was great because everybody started seeing eye to eye and they came in meetings and communications with a shared vision. And I think this is a great way um, also to have conversations um, about per your performance evaluation. Um, things that you can really focus on developing, whether it's um, going through to a fun workshop whether, or um, going to um, a class somewhere or going to a volunteer opportunity to develop those things. Any questions about core competencies or um, operating principles before I move on to the next area? Okay, so another thing I wanted to show you today was um, blue. So blue is a great way, and I hope this addresses the question about um, job families and job standards and job responsibilities and how about go about um, incorporating that into your conversation with the, your supervisor or your manager. So if um, no one's logged into Blue before, um, when you go into the people section, and it's great, all these little squares, you can manipulate yourself. You can choose what you want to see, choose what you don't want to see. You can choose campus news that you want to see that is relevant to your area. Um, so you can keep up to date about what's going on in campus. Um, so you go on that very left side, you'll see there's the Berkeley Job Builder. So that's where you want to go in if you're looking at, okay, I'm communication specialist too. What will it take for me to get to three or four? So on there, you'll see the job standards and the qualifications on that. Oops. Oh, there you go, comes back. Um, and then on the right side, you'll see uh, job categories. And um, this is basically your job family. So you can go in and search, by, search for upcoming um, current job openings here at Cal. And honestly, Blue is a great one-stop shop as far as um, um, gaining information about the campus. Um, in addition to this, you have access to the human resource page, um, UC Learning Center, where you can sign up for classes and workshops. Um, and looking at all the resources, does anybody want to share an experience where they've maybe used any of these resources or anything else that I haven't mentioned? So how do you go about finding career oppor development opportunities on campus? Anyone willing to share? Yes. Um, we, oh, was, uh, let me give you a mic really yeah. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we recently just sort of went through a reorg in our department and I think it kind of woke up quite a few of us to um, you know, kind of thinking about our careers in different ways and thinking about that. And I think several of us took the opportunity that that presented us to look into what, you know, what's offered at the Tang Center and, mm -hmm. you know, where we can go from there. So, I mean, I thought that was, that was great given that, you know, the situation was a little uncomfortable whenever you go through a reorg, it's always, mm -hmm. you know, people don't know mm -hmm. where they stand and where they're going to end up. Um, and I think, that helped us, uh, quite a few of us, as we went through that process, so. Great, well thank you for sharing. Often it's um, a little easier when you know you're sort of on the same boat and sharing that experience. And hoping being, being able to pull the resources often is really helpful. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on to, over to Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Yeah. Um, So uh, we are back to the overall career development model, but I want to focus specifically on the topic of goal setting. You know, um, goals give 
focus and direction to your energies. I was so intrigued with the keynote speakers this morning. Uh, I thought Linda Williams was so inspiring. I had never heard her speak before. But one of the things she talked about was being here now, even uh, the title of this conference today, being action-oriented now. Do you remember her saying uh, to uh, really move forward in an action-oriented way with your career? So that's one of the issues with career development, that so far we've been talking about actively gathering information, information about yourself, what you prefer, what you need, what your values are with relation to work, and also what's going on on campus, what are the opportunities, what are the trends, and so on. Sometimes people say things like, okay, I've got all this information, but I don't know now what to do with it. What do I do next? Does that ring a bell for anybody? Anybody? Okay. Okay. So that's really a process of, in, it's pretty individualized actually to integrate all those kinds of information into steps that you can take now. I am so thrilled that John Crumbles is going to be a speaker at lunchtime today. Um, I hope that you get to, I hope that all of you go to his talk. But one one of the things he really talks about a lot is action and taking small steps uh, to test steps toward your goals. So let's talk about those goals. Why is it important to test steps toward your goals? You know, does anybody ever, um, and I won't make you show uh, do a show of hands because I wouldn't know that I would want to answer this publicly, but does anybody ever shy away from setting a goal because you're not sure it's going to be exactly the right goal, or maybe you're only 90% sure you'll be able to attain that goal and oh my gosh it would be terrible if you didn't does that ring a bell for any no good <laughs> For a lot of people, that is a thought that occurs to them. It definitely occurs to me. So here's some good news. You get to own your goals. What that means is that you get to set a goal that, that serves your information, the best information you have today, and begin moving toward it. You don't have to accomplish the whole thing tomorrow. But you get to own your goals, which means that you get to adjust them for new information that you gain. One of the things that means is that every step you take, you can think of it as an experiment, right? There's no bad outcome to an experiment, you know, if you go whole, wholeheartedly with it. So I think that um, setting goals by their nature can actually help to stimulate action. I call it an antidote to inaction. Let me ask you one more question. Um, has anybody in the room gone sailing before? Does anybody have a hobby of sailing? Okay. Did I hear yeah? Okay. So support me on this. Okay, Nancy. So when at the, I used to go sailing and um, in a different part of the state where the water was a lot quieter. Uh, but one of the things that you learn early on is that when you're in a sailboat, you're actually never going in a straight line toward your destination, like a, like a beeline. You're never, is that right, Nancy? That's right. So you're tacking. You know what that means? That means that you're orienting yourself in in the general direction that you want to go based on the conditions of the wind and what your boat is capable and so on. And it's a constant process of adjusting. That's what tacking is. So did you notice that John Wilton talked about all the zigzags that he went through at the World Bank? It, did, it, it, it sounded to me like he sort of embraced that, right? So I guess I want to encourage you to not shy away from action based on goals that you take. Um, I'm a little behind in the slides here, so bear with me. It can be very helpful to keep stimulating action to balance an aspirational vision that's long-term, okay? And it can, be, um, it can be pretty grand. Don't shy away from grand visions of what your future may hold, but balance that with short-term, medium, and long-term goals. Um, does that make sense? So that you have something you can take action on today and tomorrow. Now, I happen to talk a lot about alignment. Um, probably some my family and friends probably get really tired of it, but it's important. So here what we're talking about is aligning your individual career development action goals with a couple of things. We've been talking about self-assessment information. Chris and Paula were both talking about interests, maybe being a real driver for some people, maybe making sure that um, uh, their family has economic security, which is not particularly a work-related interest, but it's a very, very important value. That may be more compelling to others. And then I want to say that if you can align your action steps for your career direction, 
with the larger goals of your organization, your department, uh, your manager, uh, that you then are in a position to negotiate support and experience a higher level of, I, I don't want to say sponsorship, because that sort of gives away your power. Um, but, you know, you're all generally marching in one direction. So let me, I will ask for a, share of hand, a show of hands this time. How many people know the department goals that, uh, of your unit or your immediate work unit for this year? Way to go. That's really powerful information. And now you can think, how do my goals kind of latch into that? In what way do they, do they touch on that? Um, in what way can leveraging my own goals help leverage the goals of the department? It's very powerful. OK, does this acronym look familiar to people? SMART goals. Would anybody be willing to share what context they've used them or seen them in? Valerie, maybe you? Okay. Um, to align with my department's goals. Thank you. My first week on my job, uh, my boss had a one-on-one -on -one with me and explained that this, I've only been here for six months, by the way. Um, my first week on the job, my boss explained to me that the SMART goal worksheet would help me develop my goals to align with the department. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So How did it work for you? Uh, it, I think it worked very well, but I found that um, it was, my goals were easier to meet. So we met again, and I have now challenged myself to take on <laughs> a lot more, but yeah. I can't help but think of Linda Williams' three C's, one of which was challenge, right? Yeah. Challenge, choice, and change. That was, that was great information. Thank you. Um, so Valerie was talking about, uh, uh, just to recap, setting her own goals and having, been, uh, having used the SMART formulation to do that. Work units often use the, the SMART formulation, so I'm going to describe it briefly, and then um, we hope that at the end of our workshop, we'll be able to give you a chance to actually set one for yourself. Okay, what we're talking about is a goal that is specific, so that if you meet it, you know what you're looking at, so you kind of have a sense of specifically what it's going to, what, what you would expect, right, to see, feel, hear, uh, if you met your goal. So you want it to be specific, measurable. You know, um, we tend to do what we can measure, and so if you can put some either numbers or qualifiers on how you're describing your goal, you will find it a lot easier to monitor it and to uh, actually keep yourself motivated toward it. Attainable. This actually means a couple of things. Of course, we want your goals to be attainable um, because, among other things, that helps you sustain your momentum, right? The experience of success is very powerful. There's another thing about this, which is that sometimes there are things that are not in your immediate control that have a big impact on your ability to succeed in meeting a goal. So consider those things when you're setting and describing your goals so that you can enlist the kind of support, uh, so that you've uh, created a goal that, uh, uh, that is well thought through. Uh, relevant, why is this goal important to you? What does it tap into? How does it have meaning to you? And perhaps to your work unit as well. Uh, and then time bound. You know, there's nothing like a deadline to get me moving. I know I don't know if that's true for anybody else in the room, but um, it, it can be a very very powerful thing to make sure that you have a sense of when you're going to follow up to see how your goals are doing. So this is a great formulation for. Uh, thinking about goals. There are materials in the uh, Career Development Action Guide about developing goals. And we also give a workshop called uh, uh, Taking Action and Setting Goals for Your Career. So you know, do feel free to come to our workshops. We love to have you. But I just want to underscore uh, a recent study. Paula found this study for us. It was uh, done locally at uh, Dominican in um, Marin. And 149 participants were set into five different uh, circumstances. And you can see that some of them were asked just to think about their goals, but they didn't have to write them down or anything like that. But there were four other conditions. Some people wrote them down, others shared them with a friend, and other people actually gave weekly reports. So what's important about this is the outcomes. Yes, it's a small study, but I expect that we'll probably see some replication of this. What the researcher found was 
about almost half again as much, 42% as much. Uh, it, it, people who wrote their goals down were about one and a half times as likely to uh, accomplish them. Isn't that kind of amazing? So that simple act of writing them down. Now, there were also impacts for people who held themselves accountable. Uh, they had even a bigger uh, uh, rate of achieving their goals uh, and those who reported out to their friends uh, or whoever was their partner in the exercise. So whether your goal remains the same as the first day you wrote it down, I still really encourage you to work with some goals and then adjust them as you need to. Like going sailing on the bay. Skill development. Uh, I want to thank you for talking about how fun it can be to develop skills. It is fun. And, you know, it's actually considered to be one of the main competencies in the 21st century by some researchers to keep developing skills ongoing. So it is a lifelong process, absolutely. Uh, we've talked a bit about how to identify skills that you may want to uh, uh, work on. And I think this might go uh, a, a bit toward your point about how do we maintain focus on some of the other aspects? So some of that is really about thinking through what skills would be fruitful, most fruitful for you to develop right now. Here are three sources of information about, uh, about potential skills to develop. But this may be the main takeaway message about uh, developing skills. Uh, you and your colleague talked about, uh, the two of you talked about going to classes, workshops, coming to the NOW conference. Very, very important. If we focus entirely on formal academic types of learning opportunities, we might be missing some major opportunity to, to a major impact. Um, what I mean by that is, and you'll be hearing about this, uh, I think, later today a little bit in a couple of the talks. Uh, on campus, it's common to talk about something called the 70-20-10 rule. Anybody heard about that before? Okay, I won't go into it deeply, but the bottom line basically is that adults really incorporate they, their skills, develop skills by using a multitude of different avenues. That, it, yes, it is important to gain that information by uh, through academic learning vehicles, but then it's equally important and actually is m even more powerful to build on that by uh, observational learning, that's one of the reasons mentors and coaches are so very important in developing professionally and as leaders, and also on the job experiences. We adults really learn by doing. That's where about 70% of the impact is. So that just allows us to think a little more broadly about how we go about those learning plans and what we might um, st be willing to step into uh, with regard to projects and so on. Does that make sense? So, uh, just to return for one second to, uh, this actually is from Blue, Re to return for one second to the uh, academic learning environments, I just wanted to showcase for you some of the uh, uh, kinds of vehicles that are available that are those forming formal learning environments. So on blue, this happens to be the headlines for the catalog. Uh, but I think it's probably most important for our purpose this morning just to notice that there are offerings across all of these topic areas. So I really encourage you to look through the catalog and uh, see what not only appeals to you based on your interests, but what, what will be aligned with goals that are important both to you and, uh, and if you want that leverage, also important to your, de your department and work unit. But now, I would really like, in closing this section, just to ask you um, for some experiences that you've had in uh, developing work skills. What's worked for you? Anybody willing to volunteer an idea? Yes. I think, uh, at the university, what I've learned since I've been here is not. Thank you. <laughs> what I've learned is it's not what you know, it's who you know. And reaching out to all those people and keep them in your circle. Uh -huh. Because as you learn, you meet more people and they have different skills than you do and you tend to absorb that. 
and yeah. your group gets bigger and bigger because things change so much at the university and as they change you sometimes don't hear about those things but because of the group uh, that you kind of surround yourself with you tend to get that information and it looks good as a development skill and you stay abreast of everything that's going on. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Such a power, your network is such a powerful uh, uh, asset for career development and learning and so on. It helps you, as you pointed out, stay in tune with what's happening on campus and helps you kind of attune what learning plans you go after. Good. Thank you. What else? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I recently, well, almost a year ago, I took on um, leading and supervising our work study staff in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Um, and I'd never really been in a supervisory role, and this was completely new to me and just completely different. I'm still still learning and still feeling really new, but um, I think what was one of the most important things for me was the observation piece and kind of just seeing how other folks in my office had done it in the past. Um, also wanting to and really interested in taking some of the, the courses that are on the catalog for uh -huh. leadership development, um, but really just kind of seeing how things have been working and now being that I've been doing this for a year, making goals to really be able to strengthen what I've done and strengthen you know, the areas that I haven't been so great at and how I can make it better, a, just a better experience for our students and a better experience for me as a leader in, in, in that capacity. Great, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that, I appreciate both of you who shared those ideas. And with that, I'm going to pass it on. We're in the home stretch here. Um, so we're gonna go through this next section very quickly and give you a couple minutes to do uh, a SMART goal. But career management, like we reviewed earlier, it's in the middle of all the components. It actually interacts with each of them. Um, the three C's include clarity, confidence, and communication. Clarity, I'm not gonna go into the six invaluable factors, but those factors are laid out there um, uh, here, demand, irreplaceability, focus, connection, authority, and ability. And I think the main, this is from David Crenshaw, um, and really it, it hammers home the, the point that you've heard a few other times already this morning about how important it is to be aligned with your department's goals uh, and priorities to, to show that you're doing things that really contribute to the bottom line of your department in meaningful and impactful ways. There was a comment earlier about uh, like, gosh, you know, I'm doing so many things. I'm, I might be even outside of my position description. I'm doing more than what's there. We're hoping that things like performance management and performance evaluations gives you an opportunity to show, you know, how you're doing, what you're doing is contributing to the goals of your department, is related to the operating principles on campus and may incorporate things like the core competencies that the, that the campus values. Um, that's all part of like a fluency of, of speaking a language that the university has embraced around kind of common operating principles and values. And, and it's, it's, it provides an opportunity for you um, going into performance evaluations to showcase what you've, what you've done. Um, confidence has to do with believing in yourself. I'm just going to, one very, um, you know, influential theory in career development um, really um, espouses the importance of career self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is really this belief in yourself. If you know how to do something and, and, um, and you know how to do that well, um, it's, it's going to move you forward. It's going to increase motivation and action towards career development goals. One way of building confidence has to do with building career self-efficacy, and it includes performance accomplishments. Regularly reviewing what are the things that you've done in the past year um, that you're really proud of, achievements in, in, your, in your position. Vicarious learning. Uh, I think there was a great example that you shared just a moment ago around connecting with others on campus, hearing what they do. Wow, when you, when you hear about what people are doing in different positions, it demystifies the unknown and it makes it more familiar. When things are more familiar, your self-efficacy goes up and your confidence in following through on goals is higher. 
Um, social persuasion is, is about, um, have you ever had mentors, supervisors, people in your life who knew you really well and your work life like, and, and very well, who could see things in you that maybe you didn't see in yourself, that you're so close to your own experience. This really speaks to things like mentorship and staying in connection with people. Um, uh, and then the last one is physiological and affective reactions. It's really about, you know, what gets you excited? Um, also, what might get you anxious? And how do you manage that in the career development process? But your own reactions and what makes you feel engaged in your work um, provides keys and clues as to what you might be motivated in terms, uh, in following through in terms of developing your goals. So those are a few things. Uh, I really liked what Linda said this morning about the self-talk, how, e how easy it is during times of change and uncertainty to have self-doubt. And um, a concept I like to use is who, if you are um, having that kind of self-doubting voice when it comes to career development, think about your own defense attorney. Um, so that's the time to pull out your defense attorney, the Chris defense attorney for myself around, okay, if I'm gonna have that doubt and think about why it isn't gonna work out, how do I give myself credit? Reflecting on things like performance accomplishments can be one way to help you feel more confident in moving forward um, during times of uncertainty. Um, Communication is about communicating strengths, building sustaining networks, um, mentoring relationships, and also things helping others see your values. We have workshops on resume writing, interviewing, cover letter writing. Um, it's a way of getting information from experts who review these um, uh, resumes and cover letters all the time to refresh your skills. And it's another way of kind of building that self-efficacy when it comes to communicating um, your strengths. So um, we're, we've kind of come to, um, about the end of our time. And um, perhaps you can take the last minute, <laughs> or, or maybe give an intro to how, to how to go about this next part. Great, thank you. Okay, we actually put a challenge before you uh, and wanna invite you to do this perhaps on one of the breaks that you have today. At the end of your handout packet, there's actually a worksheet for you to develop for yourself one smart action goal. And here's what it guides you to do is uh, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, although it can be a huge thing, uh, but formulate for yourself one objective, one goal for yourself related to career development that meets these criteria, okay? And uh, something that you feel that you can commit to. Uh, so with that, I hope that you find uh, not only the uh, experience of writing that SMART goal, but also the experience of working toward it to be fulfilling and satisfying to you. Uh, so on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for coming today. Catherine has just reminded us to be sure to ask that you fill out the session evaluation. And I might add the, um, and Catherine is standing back there with the envelope, and I just might add uh, the reminder. Paula asked if you could write the, uh, the uh, highest and lowest area on your career assessment. Uh, if you would mind sharing that, or if you would not mind sharing that with us, it'll be very helpful for us to get, uh, to have a finger on the pulse of uh, where needs are on campus. Okay. Thank you thank very you. much. We'll be around if you have some questions afterwards, but thank you for your attention today, and good luck. <laughs>